Welcome to Growing Your Dental Business, hosted by dental business coach and author, Penny Reed. This podcast is the ultimate resource to sharpen your focus and accelerate your results, ultimately leading to more profit at the end of every month. Here's your host, dental business coach, Penny Reed. Welcome to episode five. I'm your host, Penny Reed. And today I have the opportunity to interview Dr. Chris Griffin, a general dentist who's a solo practitioner, and he is the founder of the three-day dental work week system. So whether you are a solo practitioner, work with a group, or have multiple locations, Dr. Griffin's experience and mindset can be transformational for your practice. So let's tune in and listen to Dr. Chris Griffin. Well, Chris, it's great to be with you today, and you know I've known you for years. I think your story is fascinating, so rather than tell it for you, I would love for you to tell the listeners your story and your practice. Okay, Penny. Well, gosh, uh, thanks also for having me on here. You know, we've known each other for years and years, and I guess uh, to some degree, you might be part of this backstory, actually, because... Uh, Cause you were there, you know, a long time ago as part of my practice life. And so, uh, really what happened is, you know, just like most folks, they get out of dental school. So I got out of dental school and, um, uh, I went to go, I went into practice as a, as an associate with my longtime family doctor. And I mean, I was super excited about that. I thought the guy was the greatest guy in the world. And I just could not wait to be a part of his practice and someday buy into his practice, you know? And so I come out of school, I start working, um, I don't know, 10, 11 months into my one-year contract, it occurs to me that we're just not going to work out as partners. It's just not going to happen. And so, uh, you know, how it gets kind of ugly, and we had a split there after a year. And so I'm, I guess, one year out of school, uh, and this is 1999, on on uh, June the 30th, I have no job. I'm completely unemployed. Uh, my wife is three months pregnant with our first child. And, uh, you know how that goes. It's just, it's just one of those things where you just, that's a, the bottom of the barrel feeling. And I remember, uh, I, I was sitting on the kitchen floor of my old house. You know, I remember, I I even remember how the tile felt, you know, it was kind of a cold feeling. I'm calling, I'm calling all these friends of mine and local dentists and asking, Hey, uh, Hey, you need an associate. Hey, you need an associate, you know, and I, and I'm getting nowhere. I mean, I live out in the boondocks, right? I live in Ripley, Mississippi. There's, there's just nobody here. And, uh, nobody within real good driving distance either. Now I had some opportunities. I could have gone back to Memphis where I went to college and I could have worked there. Certainly, uh, had an option to go work in Nashville. Uh, I could have, could have gone to Jackson, Tennessee and worked. Uh, but you know, my wife's pregnant with her first child. Her whole family lives here. My whole family lives here. You know how that works with child support, you know? And, and so we just needed, we wanted to be close to our families as we're raising our kids. And so, you know what? I just said, yeah, I just guess I'm just going to hang my shingle and get to work. And, uh, and so I purchased some land. It took me till July the 1st to actually purchase a property with a house and an uh, acre of land. And, uh, my dad, my grandpa and me, we went to work clearing the land. And, uh, by September 1st, 1999, I saw my first patient and, uh, it was October the 31st before I took my first paycheck. It's weird. It's on Halloween. And, uh, gosh, from there that, uh, you know, we were off and running from that point and, and things went really good. And then I made some bad decisions. I had gone out to LVI and, uh, and I had bought into the fact that I could come back and I could be a cosmetic dentist, uh, in Ripley, Mississippi. Now LVI is a wonderful place. I mean, I, I really enjoyed my time there. I would go back. It's, I learned so much about you know, porcelain and all that stuff. It, it was really amazing. Love Bill Dickerson, but I tried to be a cosmetic only dentist here in Ripley, Mississippi. And then it didn't work. And I thought, gosh, I'm going to go, uh, well, gosh, maybe I need to learn more institutional learning stuff. So I went to all the big institutes, you know, I'm, I'm throwing out $25,000 checks left and right, trying to have a cosmetic only practice. And it just was not working out. And so, uh, you know, I, I really hit rock bottom somewhere in the early, part of 2000 and, um, Penny was there to help pick me up a little bit as I tried to rebuild stuff. So, so she certainly helped me start regrowing the, the, just the regular old dentistry side of the practice, try to get my name back in the community as a guy who was an okay guy that was, you know, just come for your family dentist. And, uh, so we used a ton of her strategies back then to get going, but 
I will tell you that as time went on, I kind of, I kind of was feeling burned out. You know, I was thinking, is this really what I want to do? Cause I was working a lot. Um, I was working to rebuild my practice. I was working, I don't know, at, at one point, five and a half days a week. And uh, of course then it went to five days a week, then four and a half. And I settled on four days a week for a long time, but I was working really hard those four days a week and our practice was doing great. Uh, you know, by, I guess, industry standards, if you just looked at the numbers, we were good. I'm sure top 1% practice four days a week. But I said, you know what, what number would I just be happy with? And so I was, I, I still remember I was out, I had, uh, I have a farm, a little town, seven miles from my house now, uh, inherited from my grandfather. And, uh, and I, and I had planted a bunch of watermelons and pumpkins, uh, that year, like, uh, 2000 and seven, I guess. And, and so I, I was out in there and I was, I was working, I was sweating. I was actually, I had to actually had a, a wooden handled hoe and I was chopping weeds out of the watermelons. Uh, and I was thinking, I know it's a weird thing to be thinking like this, but I was like, man, you know, I could have done so much better getting these weeds out of this watermelon patch. If I just had an extra day off work and I like, man, I'm just working too much. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, what amount of money would I be happy with? And I said, you know, if I could just make just a, uh, of course, now remember I'm a solo private practitioner. If I could just, if I could just make $125,000 a month and, and work three days a week, boy, four day weekends every week, I could work on the farm. I could do this, that go fishing, play golf more, be with my family more. I thought, I think I'm going to see, I'm just going to try it. So I tried it. That's the rest of the story. 2008, we started doing three day weeks. And, uh, there were some stumbling blocks along the way, just like you can imagine going from five days to three days. Um, uh, but here we are 2016, still doing three day weeks, still happy as a lark. Uh, you know, now I, I should be playing golf or fishing penny, but I'm on the, I'm on the phone with you here doing this interview, but I can tell you, I would never go back. Well, I'm honored that you're here to share your story. And, and while you had not planned probably to, to talk about this, you need to throw somewhere in there that your office burned to the ground. You, you, <laughs> is that coming up later? Or, I, I just think that's fascinating to hear um, because not only did you face a lot of the usual adversity, let's say, that, that most dentists face, you got some extra special adversity thrown in there. Well, you know, hey, uh, thanks for bringing that up, by the way. I'm trying to forget about that dark period <laughs> of my life, Penny. <laughs> but, hey, what, but, uh, what, are, what are friends for? I know. I mean, yeah, that is true. I mean, I, uh, I mean, that in two, I actually forgot about the flood, 2009, the flood of the century, right? The 400 year flood down here in the South, uh, got my office shut down for a few weeks, uh, that year from the flood. And then 2013, a lightning strike, uh, burned her to the ground. So yeah, we've done that. Now I got to tell you, uh, every time the tornado sirens get, go off in the spring around here, I get nervous because that's like the only natural disaster we haven't had to face yet. <laughs> so, Well, um, so tell us a little bit about, I know you're a huge advocate for the solo private practitioner and, and especially in today's dental economy, that tends to be more and more rare. So uh, why are you such an advocate for the solo practitioner? Dentistry started out you know it was just doctors and maybe a staff person i'm talking like 100 years ago and and you know maybe a couple of staff people maybe person answering the phone person helping the doctor and the doctor and i just felt like you know that's a really cool way to practice just with community involvement and you know really good one-on-one -on -one personal relationships and the reason that i'm such an advocate for the solo gp is because I actually gave this lecture in Dallas, Texas in 2012. I was I called the lecture The Coming Storm, and I sort of outlined why that I felt like the solo general practitioner in America was going to be under assault so much in the coming years. And, you know, at that time, corporate dentistry was just kind of poking its head up, and it hadn't become the, you know, 800-pound gorilla juggernaut it is right now. Uh, but it was, you know, it was growing every day. It was the fastest-growing segment of dentistry, uh, corporate practice. And it seems like today, if you read all the magazines, everybody's telling you the only way you can survive in practice is just to be either a part of a big corporation or part of a gigantic partnership, you know, with multiple doctors uh, or have multiple locations. 
in fact, I mean, back after we got to really, you know, we got this down blowing and going 2009 ish. Uh, I actually, two, two of my friends and I actually traveled up to Louisville, Kentucky, and we met with a doctor named Wayne Mortensen because he at that time owned 26 practices in Louisville, Kentucky. And so we had all thought ourselves, well, gosh, uh, you know, everybody, all these, uh, everybody's saying you got to have multiple practices to survive. And so maybe that's what we need to do because we're fearful of, you know, we didn't want things to go bad and us be left out in the cold. And we go up there and, and you know, Dr. Wayne's a great guy, you know, absolutely. Uh, and I, I'm, everything he taught was spot on, but I'll never forget the thing that he said to me that really changed my mind about owning multiple practices. I mean, he said, uh, he said, uh, Chris, you got any hobbies? And I said, well, yeah, I like to, you know, I like to play golf, like to fish, uh, you know, stuff like that. I like to go to a lot of ball games, have these kids growing up, like to go to their sporting events. And, uh, he said, well, you know, a family is first, you know, you probably do that. But he said, you know, really and truly, if you own a bunch of practices, uh, your hobby needs to be managing the practice. He said, in my case, that's really my hobby. So I'm a dentist. However many days a week, he was a dentist. And then the rest of the week, including weekends, He's, uh, he's managing his practices, his hobby, and uh, he really loved it. And I was like, wow, it's really amazing that he loves it. And I, I like, it's really impressive. Uh, but when he sort of implied that I would probably not get to play as much golf or do as much fishing, you know, I thought, well, that's no good, <laughs> you know? And so, so I was out of there and, uh, that, you know, that changed my mind for good. And ne- neither of my friends actually went through with it either. I have got a fourth friend who, um, uh, who was in kind of the same group as us. And he actually did pursue that. And he's got a very successful little dental chain now, you know, and uh, I'm impressed by him every day. Uh, but it's just not for me. And, and I really think for the majority of dentists out there, if you ask, so look at the kind of people that go to dental school, right? I mean, we're, we're probably reasonably smart folks. Um, but a little bit introverted, technically minded. You know, if you looked at the personality profiles of a lot of these dentists out there, and the penny, you're the expert on personality profiling, but most dentists are not really equipped to go out and manage multi location dental practices and be this CEO of this gigantic dental corporation. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. That entrepreneurial profile, if, if more dentists had that, I probably, I don't know, I might be working, I might be your office manager, Chris, or somebody else's. I mean, it, it's it's the lack of wanting to manage the people, think about the business side of it that I think has many dentists struggle, or, or even if they're not struggling, not truly be able to reach their potential of what they need to be doing to earn a good living and, and have that work-life balance. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you're showing there's a great, this is a great point that there is more than one right answer. There's more than one path. And while, yes, that is a way and definitely the trend to acquire multiple practices, I love that you are shining a light on what's possible for the solo practitioner, no matter where you are. Uh, Because Ripley, Mississippi, if you guys don't know where that is at the end of this podcast, especially once you're not driving your car, if you're in the car, you should look that up. Um, it's If you look up the word metropolis in the dictionary, probably somewhere later in the definition, it says not Ripley, Mississippi. <laughs> no, it's certainly, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, we're in the, uh, I guess, middle of uh, flyover country, as, uh, as some of the media thinks of us. You know, we're certainly in the middle of the red states here, uh, just in the middle of nowhere, town of 6,000. With six dentists, by the way. Um, there you amazing. go. If you if you want if you want a, if you want a little competition thrown into your small town setting, but but uh, yeah, I mean, most dentists are just not equipped to be an entrepreneur. It's just not in their bloodstream. Now they can be a great dentist, and I mean a great dentist, and they could have great interpersonal relationships with people in their community, and they can absolutely be geared for that. Absolutely, but. Asking them to, to be a CEO of a three or four dental practice chain or even bigger, that's just that's going to be tough. And it's going to lead to a lot of problems because when they figure out they don't have that gene, then they go looking for advice and they pay folks $100,000 plus sometimes for advice on how to run something like that. And, uh, you know, that's a dangerous world, too. I mean, who's got an extra hundred grand laying around just to give to somebody to tell them how to do stuff? So. I think the solo private practitioner, while 
the trend is certainly going away from that. That's absolutely where I want to be. I want to be that guy. I want to be, I mean, I want to be the guy, the, the advocate for that person out there saying, look, this is a great way to practice dentistry. There's, you can have an amazing life doing it. And it really serves the community very well when solo dentists can have a practice with a few thousand patients that they really, really can take care of very well. So I'm absolutely unapologetic about thinking that's the way it ought to be. Um, and, and so I'm, you know, that's just, that's what I think. Well, and I think it's a great message because there are many, there, there is still good work to do and a great living to be made as a solo practitioner. And for those that are really wanting to have that type of practice, I'm, I'm super excited that they're able to hear your message. So before we dive into how to make that happen, um, why don't you share from your experience some of the dangers and pitfalls of being a solo practitioner? The biggest reason that a lot of solo guys run into trouble is, you know, they take a lot of burden on their shoulders and it leads to, you know, in the past, one of the biggest problems we've had is, is burnout. I mean, a lot of dentists experience what's ter- what's coined burnout out there. Um, you know, I, I've called it, I wrote an article one time called overload syndrome. And what I really think is if you're the only dentist, you feel like all the weight of the whole practice is on your shoulders, not only the patient treatment part, but also running the practice part. And like I said, if you don't have that entrepreneurial gene, you don't love stuff like that. But a lot of, a lot of dentists too have that gene. We have that gene where we're kind of micromanagers, control freaks, if you will. And that's not saying that's a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing, but you just feel like you've got to have your finger in every single pie in the practice. And it's hard. It's hard to, it's really hard to delegate any responsibilities. Um, but one of the things that I've done that's really made my life just, I think as good as it could be is I've been a really staunch defender that you should delegate as much stuff in your practice that you legally can delegate as possible and not just clinical stuff. I mean, obviously anybody on my team that could be trained to do something that I legally don't have to do, I want them to do it, but I also want to give really good responsibilities to my, you know, like my office team members. I want them to do pretty much everything that they could possibly do. And, um, you know, I want information filtered to me in very small, concise summary reports and stuff like that. I don't want them to come to me every time something's happening. In fact, one of the rules that we have in my practice and we have for a long time is we've got, um, we've got two team leaders, right? So in my practice, uh, I don't forget how many, I've got nine, 10 employees, something like that. And, uh, but I only have two team leaders. So a rule we started way back in probably before 2008 is, uh, you know what? Do not ask Dr. Griffin if there's an issue. If you want to talk to him about what happened this weekend with your, your son or, you know, your cousin or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's totally cool. And I, I want to be, I want that kind of banter going on in the practice. But if you want to know, Hey, uh, can we give toothbrushes, to, uh, uh, for donation to this church or can, uh, can I get off work early next week? Stuff like that. Well, that's just not the kind of stuff that I want my team members asking me, right? I don't want to answer every single question in the practice. I want my team members to, to follow a pretty simple chain of command. You know, every there's two team leaders, one clinical, one front office, then everybody clinical needs to go to the clinical team leader to ask those kind of questions. Everybody at the front office needs to go to the front office person to ask those kind of questions. And then if they can't solve it, which I really try to empower them to solve pretty much anything, uh, if they can't solve it, then yeah, they can ask me a question during the work week, but nobody else can ask a, a question during the work week like that. So uh, that's something that's really made my life great. And I don't, you know what? If you give somebody the title of team leader, you give them a nice, you know, nice pay increase to do that for you. They will take an amazing load off your shoulders. And that's one of the real things that can help prevent this overload syndrome or burnout or whatever you want to call it. Well, I think that's a great point. And probably for most of the dentists listening, they're thinking, well, this sounds like nothing short of paradise. But I don't care how smart you are. 
how much your brain can multitask, there's a limit to the amount of noise, and that's just what I'll call it, noise, uh, that you can process uh, as a human being. And so those things, and it's not that you don't care, right? I mean, you've, you've established with your team, hey, we've got a budget for, let's say, the donations of the toothbrushes, you know, but you'd rather hear, oh, okay, we did that. That's awesome. Um, and have your bandwidth focused on only the things that you can handle, you know, that you went to school for or that you as the business owner need to do. So uh, I think in most cases, that's probably going to make for a much happier dental business owner. So let's talk more about this. Uh, I know you are the founder of the three-day dental work week system, the creator of that. Uh, tell us more about that. Well, so when I went to three days a week, um, you know, I was pretty, I was pretty psyched about it. And, uh, at that time I had a relate, you know, I had, I was a regular contributor to the profitable dentist magazine. So I, I was, a I guess you'd call me a columnist. So every issue I would have an article in the profitable dentist and, um, and also had a pretty good relationship with Woody Oaks. And so I, I was talking to Woody one time about going to three days a week and, uh, you know, I was expecting my numbers to drop. Uh, but Hey, they actually didn't drop. In fact, the first year, 2008, that we did three days a week, um, we actually went up $250,000 that year. And so, uh, he was like head over heels ecstatic with what I was telling him. Cause he thought that his members would really benefit from here and how I did that. So he put on a full day seminar in Louisville, Kentucky. And, um, I guess this was probably December, 2008. And I went up on stage for eight hours and I laid out the uh, three day dentist system is the name of that seminar. And so, uh, you know, that, that was actually how I got my start in speaking and anything else. So if it hadn't have been for Woody putting me on that stage, I don't know that I would have, I would even have a company right now. I probably would still just be in a dentist, which would be fine just to be a dentist. And so, yeah, now instead of playing golf this morning or going out to uh, the lake, Penny, I'm doing this podcast with you. So, uh, you know, well, well so thankfully, that, <laughs> thankfully it's not an all day podcast. You'll still have time. Right. Yeah. That was tough by the way. You know, I know you're a speaker and you, you're great at speaking all day. I'm going to tell you, I'd never spoken at all. And I'm up on stage the, the last hour of the day. I mean, it was a struggle. My voice was gone. I was hoarse. I was just destroying my vocal cords, trying to get through the presentation. You know, Woody actually uh, brought me up a, a glass of lemonade halfway through that last hour. He just he's like, and he's like, uh, took the microphone, and said, "Folks, uh, you know, pay close attention now and listen hard to Dr. Griffin. I know he's losing his voice, but hey, you got to understand, it's it's tough speaking all day if you've never done it." You know, so I'm like, wow, man, Woody, he's, he's, everybody's feeling sympathetic for me and stuff, but, uh, <laughs> you, you were know. leaving it all on the field, man. That's what you Yeah, I, I left it all in the field. I, 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 my voice didn't recover for two or three days. That's for sure. It was, it was a lot of fun, but Hey, it was a lot of fun. It sort of made me focus and realize. Cause when, you know, when I was telling Woody the story, he's just like, wow, how are you doing this? And I, I don't know that I knew how I was doing it. I just had been doing it. And mm -hmm. then, uh. And then I realized to do this seminar, I had to actually put together a very, you know, understandable blueprint of what I was doing. And, uh, and so that was the beginning of this whole idea. And so since then, we've actually taught this sort of system. We call it the three day dental work week system. And, and let me just say this. So one of the confusion points that a lot of people have with this is, oh, well, okay, well, I'm not going to work three days a week, so I shouldn't listen to this. Uh, have you, have you ever, Penny, I know you probably have, you've read that book, the four hour work week, right? I love the four hour work week. Yes. Okay. So Tim Ferriss, a uh, great author, uh, has a great podcast too, by the way. Um, so now, Hey, you're in good company. You and Tim Ferriss both have great podcasts. Uh, but so, so Tim has this book, the four hour work week, and it's all about how theoretically you could work four hours a week and make a great living by doing online business. Anybody that knows Tim Ferriss, I'm pretty sure the dude is not working four hours a week. I mean, he's got a podcast. He's on interviews all the time. There's always publishing articles. He's writing books, uh, you know, among other things. And it, so he's not working four hours a week, but it's just an amazing concept. And if you read the book, the, uh, the jacket of his new book, 
you'll just see testimonial after testimonial of people that are in there and they've, oh my gosh, it just, the four hour work week changed my life. It changed my life. It helped me so much. That's so it was the concepts and the principles inside that book that, that helped people not go to a four hour, four hour week, but it helped them go from a 60 hour week to a 40 hour week, or maybe a 40 hour week to a 30 hour week, or maybe even a 20 hour week. But see, the concept is that, you know, that, that you improve your life by uh, streamlining your systems. And so that's really the whole principle behind the three day dental work week. It's not that I'm saying, Hey guys, I work three days a week. So you should work three days a week. Um, that's great. I think it is amazing if you can go to three days a week. I think that's the ideal amount of days to work each week for a dentist like we are with our personality type. You, you may be, you're, you're listening to this and you're working currently five days a week or good grief, five and a half days a week. Like I used to, and you're just so stressed out and you know, you're getting close to burning out. You just don't know what to do about it. Well, hopefully maybe I could inspire some of you guys to really take a hard look at your, at the way you're practicing. Maybe you can improve a few things in a few areas and take that extra day off a week. And you're still, you're not working three days. Now you're working four days. But it makes your life so much better because that extra day to recharge just means so much to everybody. And especially us as dentists out there who I'm telling you, Penny, no, I don't care how much the media probably uh, rips on us or whatever and say, oh, you know, they have this cushy lifestyle. You know what? Dentists have interpersonal relationships every single day with like 40, 50, 60 uh, next week, I've actually got over 70 patients a day on the books each day. Wow. And so I'm actually going to have to, and it's not in my, my nature to be nice to people, right? I want to be introverted <laughs> over in the corner. I want to be I want to be playing on a computer or writing, writing or uh, something like reading a book. That's what I want to be doing. But I've actually got to talk to 70 people each day next week because it's, you know, it's a holiday and the kids are all out of school. And i got to be nice to them. And I got to really care about them and I got to focus on their treatment plan and try to help them and find ways for them to pay for treatment. And I, I have to do all those things. And so dentistry is just such a hard, hard profession. You know, we deserve to be rewarded. Uh, I'm not going to uh, sit back and say, oh, you're right. We make too much money or whatever. That's ridiculous. We work super hard for what we get. And there's nothing wrong with us finding ways to cut days off our schedule so that we can practice longer into the future. I mean, if you, if you only work two or three days a week, I say you can practice till you just keel over chair side with the hand piece in your hand, Penny. I, I, I really think that there's no reason why it's a wonderful profession. And I think, uh, if we would all learn how to streamline so we could cut back, it would just make so many things better. So, uh, Yes. I mean, that's kind of the whole premise behind the three day work week system and why that I feel like, I mean, I think it's great. I think it's ideal, but the whole idea is take the principles and make your life better. You know, doesn't have to be three days, but just make your life better, whatever you do with those principles. Well, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned, you know, take, take the principles, take some of the tools, even if the three day work week may not be exactly what you're thinking about, but I've also seen, a partnership practice where they've adopted this, you know, several examples where they, the, the day that they're in the office together is Wednesday. So the practice may be open five days a week and they have teams on a rotation, but they figured this out too. So that the individual dentist is only chair side three, you know, three days a week, but the practice, you know, for that particular model is open more. So really, uh, even though your message I think is targeted to that solo practitioner, there are definitely things that, that can be gained that will help, I would say, any practice from an efficiency standpoint, especially after seeing how you guys work. So um, what would you say are some of the reasons, Chris, why some dentists might be scared of cutting back an extra day each week? Well, I think one of the, one of the biggest, I mean, the obvious issue, right, is loss of income. Uh, I think that a lot of dentists, and you know, we're notorious, just like a lot of professionals, of spending our money before we make it sometimes. And, you know, we like we like toys. And, and what I think it I think you feel like you feel like you work so hard and you went to school and you sacrificed four years of your life or plus if you're a specialist, you sacrifice more than four years of your life in your prime uh, to you gave that to this profession. And the, the idea was if you gave that to this profession in your prime, 
this profession would pay you back the rest of your lifetime. And, and so sometimes when you get out there and things aren't quite as easy as you expected, you maybe you're not making as much as you thought you would or whatever, uh, and you don't have the money maybe to pay cash for something. Maybe you, you know, you get a big house, you get, uh, you get a, a boat or whatever you buy things that, you know, you feel like, you know what, you deserve it. And you maybe buy it for your, before you should have. And next thing you know, you owe the bank a lot of money and, uh, you're like, Oh heck, now I've got all these bank loans. I got student loans probably. And gosh, the, the, the guys getting out of school today, the guys and the gals getting out of school right now, they've got gigantic student loans, most of them. And so you got all these loans and you just feel like I can't cut back, you know, I've, I've got to do what I'm doing, uh, and pay these loans off and, uh, pay this house note off. And now, you know, uh, my spouse and I are getting ready to have a family, you know, got to pay for that. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a snowball effect and you just feel like you can't cut back. I'm here to tell you, I've consulted with a lot of practices over the last, since 2008, I guess the last eight years. And I've never, never consulted with a practice who, uh, maybe at first they said this, but who thought, oh yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't cut any waste out of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a fact of life that most every, uh, all dental practices in America, they've just got a lot of wasted time built into the schedule. You know, if they're there four days a week, I can assure you there's a full day of not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a, um, a, a, a good friend of mine is a doctor from Oklahoma and he's, he's, um, Dr. Bob Willis. And he's, he's talked to Dennis for years. He's been on the lecture circuit for probably 30 years and uh, one of the things that he said that really struck me, and I'll, I'll give him credit for this because I didn't think of it, but it is absolutely true, is, uh, you know, he'll, he'll ask the audience out there to raise their hand. You know, he said, okay, uh, who in here is taking six weeks vacation every year? And, you know, maybe one or two raise their hand, but almost nobody raised their hand because six weeks, that's a lot of vacation time, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he'll say, well, okay, I can see everybody out here is a liar because every one of you is taking uh, six week vacation. It's just, you're not taking it away from the practice. You're taking it in between patients, you know, going back to your office, sitting around, playing on the computer, you know, just wasting time here and there. And it is true. Every dentist is just wasting a lot of time during the day while they're supposed to be seeing patients that they could be doing something more productive if their systems were streamlined to the point that they, that allowed them to get something done productive. It's just, most people don't understand that. And when I go into practices to consult with them, a lot of times they just, they don't understand it. They don't really, they're especially the front office staff, like the scheduler, they just don't get it. They're like, but what, what we, we're already booked. I don't understand. We're already booked. And I would say, look, you know, dragging that appointment block down to, till it meets the other appointment block doesn't mean that you're booked that whole time. Uh, you're wasting 20 minutes. You're wasting 30 minutes. You know, let's let's figure out what's going on and how long stuff really takes you to do, and let's get going and and let's actually be more productive. And then, you know, you got two choices. You can either use this strategy to make more money, which is fine, but I prefer you make the same amount or slightly more and uh, take off some more time, so you don't have to be at the practice the whole time. So that. That's that's one of the main things I think loss of income. Well, I, well, sure, sure, and I I think just to touch on because boy, it could be another podcast or probably a full day seminar on the schedule. There's some mental gravitational pull that has uh, whoever's making appointments think that they must start on the hour or the half hour. Um, I, I don't know where that came from, <laughs> but when when you just take a glance at the average practices schedule, there's some. You know, there's there's some unspoken law apparently that says hour and half hour. Um, you know, this is not a shuttle that's transporting people from their hotel room to some other place that only runs every 30 minutes. So, uh, I definitely agree uh, that that in most practices there's a lot of opportunity with the time management. Um, so, how long would you say that it takes to incorporate the three day system into an already established practice? Listen, so, I mean, I, I know it causes a lot of turmoil when you do something like change your schedule so abruptly. And if you're the, if you're just so into it that you just want to chop a day off and just go for it right now, I guess that's okay. I myself was, a, I was a little more pragmatic about it. I, in 2007, I'm chopping weeds and I decided to do it. 
I've got six months of hygiene patients, right? That are booked. Every dentist does every six months. You got people that have already scheduled. And so I looked out at my schedule and I said, you know what? I feel like I can get, you know, let's just go ahead and let's just do four days the rest of this six month period. But I'm telling them next Monday, do not book anybody else on Thursdays from now on. Just book Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's it. No more Thursdays. And of course, it kind of freaked my staff out over the six month period while we were waiting to get to that. uh, We talked about what we're going to do. You know, we're already doing this here Uh, now. You know, I talked about a lot. Another concern a lot of people have is staff because they're freaked out. They're like, oh, no. Well, what am I going to do about my pay? I don't understand. And so that gives you time to work that out. And so I listen. So like I said, do not expect your income to go down. Absolutely. Uh, I have, uh, you know, case study after case study where that does not happen. So just take my word for it. The income should not go down if you do this right. So your income's the same. Now, theoretically, your team might be working fewer hours. Now, I encourage you to have your team come in on the day off they used to work and at least spend half the day training and catching up because your days are going to be more productive. I think that you, they need a little catch up time. So let's just say they're down a few hours each week. I personally give people the option to go ahead and work those hours. As long as they're under the supervision of the team leader and they can turn in checklists to show what they've done, whatever, as long as they're productive, that's fine. You could also just pay them salary, pay them what they were making. Just, you know, they're just not there as much and they'll like that. It gives you a certainly gives you an advantage in hiring people when they learn that you're paying people what they would make in a full week and now they're only working three and a half days a week, I mean, that gives you a definite hiring advantage. You'll get the best of the best in your area. Uh, so I, I say spend that six months getting your systems down and then, hey, pull the cord, boom, go to three days a week. And uh, I bet you, you'll just you'll never look back, just like me and just like a lot of the dentists that I've helped go to this three-day thing. Well, I I think you you touched on something that that I think is absolutely imperative, and and you'll probably agree once you hear what it is, the suspense is killing you, isn't it, Um, (laughs) to your continued and consistent success, most practices do not invest time in training. And, And I don't necessarily mean they don't go to continuing education or they don't bring a consultant in. I mean, that's a small piece of it. But they're, in, in order to stay consistent, there has to be practice that takes place um, and, and sometimes supervised practice. So you bring new people on board. You can't train them in your, you know, effectively, uh, completely in your three day. If you're seeing 70 patients a day, uh, they might get a little bit of training. So um, I know that this may not have been, you know, something that, uh, that you had planned to talk about. But I, I mean, what are your thoughts on the role that, you guys being able to keep your systems tight um, on those Thursday mornings, what, how, how big of an effect do you think that has? I don't know that we could make the three-day schedule work if we didn't have the fourth day for what I just said. We, they, what they do in my office is they catch up from 8 to 10, and then from 10 to 12 they train uh, on new stuff or, you know, like, I think three weeks out of the month, they each, uh, like the clinical people train. My hygienists don't, my hygienists do not come in on those days. At your own peril, ask your hygienist to come in on a day where there's no patients. So sure. I'm not that, I'm not that crazy, but everybody else, all the assistants and stuff, they train with the clinical team leader, uh, and the front office they train and you know, there's role play in, there's, uh, all kind of cool stuff you can do. Also, you're looking to, Hey, nobody wants to get HIPAA audited. Well, there's your built in time to go ahead and get those official HIPAA things done. Uh, you don't have to pay these companies to do all this expensive stuff. You can just buy the ADA book and go down the list and have the meetings when you're supposed to, Mm -hmm. uh, all this stuff, you can spend those Thursdays and your team leaders need to be responsible. And that's why you need good team leaders to, uh, to, to write out the schedule and to make sure the things that need to get done are getting done. And then just let them roll with it. And I think once a month we have a whole team meeting on those Thursdays uh, instead of just department by department. Uh, so I absolutely think that the fourth day is absolutely. And if, it, like I say, if you were working five and you go to four, it'd be your fifth day. But if they're already working, they come in then half a day, they're going to love the half day off. 
and the other half a day, that is what's going to give your practice the fuel and the strength to be able to pull off the shorter schedule while still making the same amount of money. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's nice. And I can remember back in the day, many, many years ago, when I worked for the dentist that I worked for, when we did have that time during the week, you know, to go, you know, do the grocery shopping or go have coffee with a friend or, or you know, whatever that may be on that half day during the week. And, and my other friends that worked in other industries, you know, they weren't they weren't finishing up their work day until, you know, 5 p.m., uh, you know, on that day. So it's it's great for, and you know, let's face it, in dentistry, most of our dental team members are female. So, um, you know, they've got their, their, whether it's wife responsibilities or mom responsibilities, it gives them more time and I think more energy to be available for their family as well. So I, I think it's a definite win-win. Um, so hopefully you guys that have tuned in today have, have gleaned some pearls or can go back and look at some of the things that you're doing in your practice. And um, as far as being able to connect with Dr. Griffin, if you will go to my website, you'll not only be able to download the transcript for today's podcast, there will also be information there on how to reach out to him. And uh, one of the things that I'm super excited about, uh, it's it's both an honor and, and I think a privilege to be able to partner with Dr. Griffin on this, is we put together a team growth event that will take place at the beach in the spring of 2017. So um, that information will be at beachseminar.com. And Chris, what comments would you like to make on that event that we've put together? Well, uh, obviously, I'm super excited about it. Uh, I I had I used to do a lot of seminars. I actually put on a lot of seminars myself, and I took a year off uh, in 2016, kind of kind of recovering from that fire you talked about. It just sort of took a lot of wind out of my sails and stuff. But you know what? Uh, that year was enough, and and I was so excited to partner with you because I, I, if you you know if you guys are listening to this podcast, you already know Penny. I mean, she's amazing high energy person she's amazing with staff she's probably the best i've seen at just really getting teams motivated enthusiastic and able to produce at a high level and so you combine that with the systems that i've really really worked hard on uh you know and my systems were created in an in an effort to give me more time off you know selfishly but i think my systems are pretty darn streamlined and so if you take those kind you know we're gonna she's gonna take her enthusiasm combine it with the systems that i've created and, uh, and also throw in all the stuff she knows, and I'll be there to throw in all the stuff that I know. And we just thought we'd create this event, uh, you know, a day and a half basically in paradise. If you've never been to uh, Sandestin, Florida, I think it's as close to paradise as you can get. I, I really think, I'm not lying, this is the best beach in the United States of America. I mean, I've been to pretty much all the beaches in the regions you can go to. This is the best beach in America, and so you're at paradise, plus... We're going to help you make 2017 the best year you've ever had because we're going to get your team absolutely fired up and ready to go. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know how you can beat this. I mean, it's like have fun at the beach, have your best year ever. I mean, this is like the best tagline for a seminar ever, Penny. So it I think. is. So it it's, is. It's, a, it's a magical combo. And, and what else I think is pretty cool is Sandestin, Florida happens to be the place where you and I both did our first full day lectures in front of uh, audiences of hundreds. So it's, it's also kind of like a nostalgic bit there too, but I would agree. Uh, My family and I have been going to that beach on vacation for as long as I can remember. It is, it's absolutely gorgeous. And we've already got uh, uh, over, well, I think, you know, close to 10 offices that are signed up for this. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll create an even better problem and, and may need to, uh, to get a bigger room. So if you are interested in that, reach out to us and we'd love to talk with you about it. Thank you again, Chris, for your time today. I, I, I look forward to uh, hearing about what great adventure you went on next. If you caught the biggest fish ever or uh, had a, had a chance to go hunting. But I truly think when most dentists, when you had that dream of going to school to be a dentist and, and help other people and, you know, make them feel better, that there was also that I'm going to work for myself and and this dream that all that hard work would pay off and you would actually have time to do those things. And uh, I think it's awesome to hear how you're keeping that dream alive. And again, I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Penny. And uh 
I'm looking forward to seeing you next spring. Me too. Thanks for listening to Growing Your Dental Business Podcast. For more information, transcripts, and resources, please visit us at growingyourdentalbusiness.com.